Good morning, everyone, and thank you for participating and welcome and thank you for participating in the Know Your Candidate Forum sponsored by the Georgetown Cultural Citizens Memorial Association and uh, uh, Georgetown and Southeast Georgetown Community Council, lovingly known as, known as GCCMA and SEGCC. Uh, my name is Regina Durden, and I will be your moderator for this session. Mr. Chuck Collins with SEGCC will be our engineer and will be assisting in questions and, answer, and uh, keeping track of the questions and keeping time uh, as we go through this session. This morning, we're going to be taking time out to get to know our candidates running for the city, city of Georgetown Council Member for District 6. Our candidates are... Our incumbent, Ms. Rachel John Rowe. Hello, Rachel. Hi. And our challenger, Mr. Michael Walton. Mr. Walton, could you say hello? Good morning. Good morning. And thank you so much for being here and taking time. You know, it's very important that uh, we all get to know our candidates and, and allow you the opportunity to answer questions that our community is concerned about for this election 2020. But before we get started, I do have a few announcements. Everyone is on mute right now to preserve the quality of this um, uh, forum. The forum is going to be is being recorded right now so that it will be posted on the SEGCC and the GCCMA website. We are asking our questions uh, on the Slido, it's S-L-I-D-O dot com uh, site, uh, and it's uh, session K263, that's session K263 on www.slido. Questions will be, will be asked based on popularity. Now, we did send some of the questions to our candidates beforehand, and we plan on asking those questions. But if we see that there are some pressing questions that have not been given, we will move our questions and ask the questions that you feel are most important. So don't, please don't use the Q&A or the chat box that's within Zoom. Please use the Slido. So now for our format, okay? The format will begin with the candidates given three minutes to do opening statements. And then we will follow with a series of questions that, will be, that we will also allow the candidates three minutes each to answer. And we'll just keep asking the questions as time allows. And uh, we expect that the questions may change depending on the popularity in Slido. So do you have all of that? And are you ready to begin? If you want to get a really good view and you want to look the candidate straight in the eye, then go to speaker view rather than gallery view. It's your choice. Okay, so let us begin. We'll begin with, like I stated earlier, we'll begin with introductions. Each candidate will be given three minutes to introduce themselves. We're asking them to include their backgrounds, Explain to us why you're seeking this position and what do you see the major duties and responsibilities for the position? We'll start with Ms. John Rowe. You, your three minutes will begin now. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Chuck. And thank you to everyone uh, that's involved with the GCCMA and the SEGCC. I really appreciate you guys putting this important forum together. Um, and I think the questions that you guys are asking today are particularly important ones during this time. Um, looking at the format we're engaging in today, it's a, it's a new one for a lot of people, and it's uh, required us to sort of be flexible and pivot quite a bit. It's also a reminder that we are living through a pandemic right now, and we are all in uncharted waters together. Um, the latest numbers for Georgetown when it comes to COVID-19 are there are at least 1,500 cases that have been um, um, diagnosed in Georgetown. There's probably more, uh, 23 deaths. And I want to let everyone know that those of you who are mourning the loss of a loved one, if you're taking care of someone that's recovering, if you're recovering yourself, um, my heart is with you and I'm committed to helping the community during this time. So please reach out to me. Is that a buzzer or was that? No, no, keep going. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. 
Um, so for those of you that don't know, I'm Rachel Jean Rowe. I'm the incumbent in this race and I'm running for re-election. Um, I think I've demonstrated over these last nine years serving you that I'm committed to service and putting people first. Um, it's all about serving my constituents for me. Um, and so I want to, I, I would love the opportunity to continue to build upon the work that we've done together as a community. I'm all about collaboration, building bridges between the different neighborhoods within my district, um, recognizing the unique needs and challenges of each neighborhood, but also looking for the common ground that we all have, because I think we all want to make Georgetown a better place for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren. So I look forward to having the opportunity to do that with you. Thank you, Ms. John Rowe. Now, uh, Mr. Walton, your time begins now. Okay, thank you, Regina. My name is Michael Walton, and I am running for the District 6 City Council seat. I was, I uh, want well, thank you to GCCMA and SEGCC for having this forum. This is the third of what I believe to be only three forums that I think they're very important to help the citizens uh, with their decision process on who they want to vote for, uh, and thank you for having it. Um, and thank you for letting us go first um, today. Sure. So I was uh, born and raised in Houston, Texas. Um, got my undergraduate degree from Florida State University. Just as a long story, which I've already told on other, other sessions. Uh, moved back to Texas in 2001 and moved to Georgetown in 2013. Uh, also got an MBA from Texas State in 2013. Uh, and when I moved to Georgetown, I was, you know, I was excited to be here. Um, I knew about Old Town, I knew about Downtown, but honestly, I did not know about TRG. I didn't, I had never heard the term, I didn't know where it was, I didn't know it existed. As time went by and I got more involved in the community and particularly when I joined Preservation Georgetown, I started to learn more about the area, but still not much. Uh, then in 2017, as a board member and as a member of the Committee for the Preservation Fund grant program, I, was, I became more engaged because we gave a grant to Wesley Chapel uh, to uh, repair its foundation. And through that process, I met a lot of people in the area. I met a lot of members of the church. But most importantly, I just learned that TRG existed, a bit about its history and its importance to the community of Georgetown. After that, in 2018, I went to a community session at the Medelia Hilliard Community Center uh, to listen to the residents uh, speak about their areas and their concerns. And I heard the main concern is that they were not being heard, that nothing was happening, that they were, they felt like they were invisible. And something that struck me was that they felt like the city and particularly the council doesn't care about them and doesn't care to learn about them. Um, I sat at a table with five residents and I heard their specific concerns. I wrote them all down added a summary conclusion. I shared that information with city council, city staff, those that were at my table, and many of the citizens and members of Preservation Georgetown. And two years later, uh, as far as I can see, not much has changed. Thanks, Chuck. Um, all right. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Ms. John Rowe and Mr. Walton for those introductions. And now we're gonna just dig into our questions. So let's start by uh, talking and getting your ideas on Georgetown housing. In 2030, comp the, the 2030 comprehensive plan was adopted by the city council on March 10th, 2020, which includes housing elements with three themes, one affordability, neighborhood preservation and diversity. It appears to be difficult uh, to initiate conversation with leaders about affordable housing and its subject is continuously placed on the back burner while there's a waiting list of over two, up to two years for affordable housing. What we like to know is what are your criteria for determining the needs for constructing new affordable housing for you know, the everyday worker, the industry worker, the uh, retail 
uh, care attendant, health professionals, teachers, senior citizens. Mr. Walton, we'll begin with you. Your three minutes begins now. Thank you. <clears throat> so as is mentioned in the question, uh, affordable housing includes a variety of groups with a wide ver variety of economic uh, situations. And I believe that whatever we build in Georgetown needs to address that variety. So it's not just the lower end of affordable housing or the middle or the upper, it's all of it. Uh, and we need to be sure that whatever is being proposed will be suitable for that variety and available to those that need it without putting undue burdens on the city as a whole. Uh, I do need to learn more about this topic and I have already started some conversations with a few people that know more than I do and they're ready to educate me. Uh, we're just getting started with that and it's focused on email right now, but I welcome that information. I do need to learn more about this subject. Um, I do believe that incentives should be thoughtfully used, eliminating all property taxes for development that only has about 10% uh, of its capacity as affordable is not really the best approach in my opinion. Uh, outside of property tax, there are other ways to incentivize these developments and we should explore what those are and how they can be used. Um, lastly, I think that whatever gets built needs to be built in the right place with the appropriate infrastructure we shouldn't just build it to build it if it causes new or additional problems for those that are going to live there. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. John Rowe, your three minutes begins now. Thank you. I think it's pretty clear that the, the need and the criteria already exist. Um, you mentioned the 2030 housing element, which makes it very clear um, that affordability in housing is already an issue. You can also look at the Southeast Georgetown Needs Assessment that was done with the Georgetown Health Foundation. You can look at the data and the recommendations from our Housing Advisory Board. You can look at the results from the On the Table events that were hosted across the city, our citizen surveys, everything, every document that's available to us in recent years on this topic makes it clear that there is a need for more affordable housing in Georgetown. And with the rate that we're growing, in order to keep pace with that need, we need to see more investments and we need to see more positive votes in favor of different, a variety of afford, affordable housing options, not just um, large multifamily developments stuck along the main arteries of our um, community. We also need to see it integrated more thoughtfully and in smaller infill projects. Um, we need to see it involved in the ground up from our uh, planned communities that are going in. Um, there's a lot of cities out there that already are doing this successfully. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, we can look at the St. Paul area where they've had a very an excellent program. We can look at places like Detroit um, that have been making these kind of investments in their communities because they understand that those communities that have affordable housing options thrive. Okay, they benefit everybody. When we have um, diverse groups of people living in the same city in the same neighborhoods, it, it lifts all boats. Um, so I think we need to see a city council that is um, not just paying lip service to this idea, but making significant um, policy and financial commitments um, to uh, remedying the current deficit we're already in and being in a better position. I also think that we need to make sure that it's geographically across the entire city, that we're not seeing clusters in any one area because um, we need to consider the impact on our schools. Um, and also, again, it's a benefit. When we have diversity in every area of the city, every school will benefit. Those students and families will benefit. Um, and we also need to expand. A lot of the discussion in recent years has focused on workforce housing, and I think we actually need to expand that discussion and also talk about transitional housing because we have a significant homeless population in Georgetown and it's not always what people think it is. Um, our housing community is a houseless community is um, teenagers who are couch surfing because they've been kicked out of their homes. It's women that are leaving abusive situations. So we need to recognize that and, and meet that need immediately. Right. Thank you, Mr. Walton and Ms. John Rowe for that, for your responses. Now we're going to kind of move on to neighborhood preservation, very similar, but there's been a lot of discussion 
about uh, and concerns about neighborhood preservation. And uh, I think Mr. Walton mentioned TRG and um, for at least the past two decades, the residents of the Track Ridge Grasshopper TRG neighborhoods have fought to preserve history and culture of their area from encroachment, increased traffic, the building of oversized housing, and other hazardous conditions. The results of a recent survey, as I think you both mentioned, indicated that the residents want to allow homeowners to remain in their homes without being subjected to commercial development and increased property taxes. We know that Georgetown is one of the largest fastest, or not largest, but the fastest growing uh, towns in, in the nation. And so this is something that needs to be addressed. We need to know how will you assist TNRG residents achieve their goal, especially because this is, you're representing that area. What new or different ideas or approaches do you have in resolving these community issues, involving the community itself in developing these neighborhood plans and ensuring that they have a vote and a role and a voice. Um, we'll start with Ms. John Rowe. Three minutes begins now. Thank you, Regina. One of the interesting data points for me that came out of the update to the 2030 plan was to look at my district and see that it actually has the second highest um, property value in all of Georgetown, and yet we also have the lowest incomes um, on average in my district. So what this does is set up a perfect storm where many of us living in this district are sitting on some of the most valuable properties in all of Georgetown and one of the fastest growing cities in the entire country, and yet don't have the resources to um, make our voices heard at the city council or to hire lawyers to protect us if we think something's happening or get any of those. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of us don't have those tools that are available to more um, wealthy communities. And I couldn't agree more that it is taking too long to afford some of the same protections to our historic minority neighborhoods um, that, that we've had in the Old Town overlay for years. Now, I actually don't know how long it took to get those over the um, master, the sorry, the, the downtown guide, the guidelines for the downtown and Old Town. I imagine it was a process that took some time. Um, we are working on the small area plan and I think we need to be thoughtful and invest the time we need to do to get the right product so it is something that the entire council and the community can all get behind and I am eager to get that end result um, but we need to be thoughtful that we're not going too fast on that. That being said government often moves incrementally and it frustrates me no end sometimes because I want to see change like you know happening like that so I can only imagine the level of frustration within the community that's most impacted. And I want everyone watching to know that I understand there's a disconnect there. Um, systemic change often requires building large enough coalitions that a sluggish and reluctant government will finally see and acknowledge the need for significant action. And I think we're on the cusp of a tipping point where we could actually see that action happening. Um, we have seen uh, traffic mitigation plans put in place that are baby plan. They're, they're brand new. And so I'm waiting to see what the actual results are. If it actually, when people in, um, implement that to, to get staff working on looking at mitigation measures, for example, on scenic. Um, we still need to see what the result is, and I'll be watching that very closely. We also need increased awareness outside of the TRG about your rich history and culture. Um, we need increased awareness and participation in related events like participation in the shotgun house tours and Juneteenth events. Um, like I said, we need to continue with the small area plan. We need to, and that small area plan, I would like to see it include elements of uh, locally owned businesses being supported and also look at the future of the jail because I think that's going to be instrumental in looking, partnering with the county to redevelop that into something that, that services that community and feels like a good fit. All right. Thank you, Ms. John Rowe. And Mr. Walton, your three minutes begins now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think, you know, we've been hearing some things that are, interesting and concern me a little bit, which is uh, that the residents feel they don't have a voice in council and uh, that they are not being heard. Uh, I went, I, t I walked through the TRG neighborhood a couple weekends ago and one of the things that really jumped out at me was when I met some folks and talked to them 
is when I met a younger uh, lady, she said she lived in her grandmother's house and across the street were her aunt and uncle and around the corner was her mother. Uh, I talked to another young lady who told me a very similar story. Her family's lived there uh, for four generations. Uh, you started the question mentioning preservation. And I think by far the most important thing that needs to be preserved in the TRG are those uh, community relationships and the heritage of the people that have been there for so many generations. Of course, the buildings matter too, but the personality and the community aspect I think is most important. Um, I think the development of the small area plans is a good start and we certainly need to continue to engage with the residents of the TRG to get their input, but we also need to make sure absolutely that they understand what is gonna be proposed. They need to sign up for it versus it being signed up on their behalf. Um, I think an easy first step to help with this issue is to formalize the boundaries of the TRG, uh, install some signage uh, that informs people about the area and get the history documented and posted on the city's historical website. We have that for Old Town and Downtown. We don't really have that for TRG. And then lastly, we need to take action. We need to ask for the input, get it um, from them and actually use it. Take action. Something needs to be done. And at least since I've been in Georgetown for almost eight years, uh, I don't see that anything that has been done and what that needs to change. Thank you. Thank you both for your responses. I, I heard, you know, that, you know, there needs to be a voice. Uh, it, it's, to me, it's ironic that city council is right around the corner from the people that they're not even willing to hear. So hopefully uh, through this conversation and after the election that their voice will be heard, especially since we're there in the same neighborhood that we're having the conversation. So next, let's just move on to the, you know, there's a lot of things that have been going on in addition to COVID. As you know, there's been civil unrest on every hand. Um, do you believe that systemic racism is an issue in Georgetown? And if not, could you tell us how will you work with the community who does believe that it does exist? And if you do believe that it exists, what will you do to assist the community in addressing this issue? Now, this could include, you know, how are we addressing current protests and wearing masks and all of these different issues. And then on the other hand with that, we know that the police chief, Nero, has a, an initiative called Community to improve relationships and policing in the Georgetown community. What are your thoughts on his initiative and how do you think it will help as we look at and, and talk about uh, the systemic racism or civil unrest? Uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Walton, and your three minutes begins now. You're muted, you're muted. Sorry about that. So again, the way the question is worded, I think it's important to note that it doesn't matter if I personally believe it exists or not. If anyone believes it exists or if it has happened to them, then it matters. And it's very important that we identify exactly where it is, what is happening, by whom and when, you know, all the details of it so we can eliminate it. Just saying that it exists or believing that it exists, to me, isn't enough. Uh, if it is happening, we need to stop it. Uh, I need to be educated and informed. This, you know, if, it's not ha if it is happening to somebody by the nature of racism, it's likely that it's not happening to me and I'm not experiencing it personally. So I need to hear about it. I need to know where, when and where so I can take action. Uh, it's not enough for me simply to take action within my own life and you know avoid it, not do it. Uh, we need to make sure that we know where it's happening. Uh, and the only way for this to happen is for us, for me and everyone else to listen. We need to engage with the people that have experienced it, get the details and take their action. Um, as for protesting, I think the First Amendment rights enable us to do so and I will support peace with protest in all forms. Um, 
I'm not, did I answer the wrong question? No, here we go. Sorry. No, no, no. Um, I have a lot of questions within my question. So yeah. Yeah, you're on track. You're on track. So as far as the community initiative, I'll try to be quick here. I think it has a, a merit and promise. And implementing the advisory task force is a significant step uh, to ensure that both the citizens and the police department have a, have a voice. Uh, when I moved here, one of the first things I did was go through the Citizens Police Academy. And that really opened my eyes to the complexity of the department and everything they do. Um, I think GPD has done a good job of getting officers out into the, commu into the community, but we need more of that. If you put faces to names and everyone gets to know each other, then we, ha we can establish respect and understand where everyone's coming from. Uh, lastly, I just want to say I was endorsed by the Georgetown Police Officers Association because of I do support GPD. And I think uh, we need to work with them uh, to ensure they have the resources and the ability to get what they need and successfully implement initiatives like this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your responses, your open and honest responses on that. And hopefully uh, uh, we'll all find a little bit. Yes, I haven't had an opportunity oh, to respond. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting confused. I'm so sorry, Rachel. That's Rachel. all right. I know going back and forth. <laughs> yeah, I think I got yeah. thrown off when someone came in. So, yes, yeah. I'm sorry, Ms. John Rowe. Please, your three minutes begins now. Okay. Well, first of all, I do believe systemic racism is real, and I think it is an issue everywhere, not just in Georgetown. Um, however, if you'd asked me that question nine years ago, I don't know that I would have known the meaning of the word. So I have to really thank the folks that uh, helped begin my anti-racism journey, and that started right here in Georgetown with Courageous Conversations, um, which I participated in from their very first meeting at the Georgetown Public Library. And it really opened my eyes and expanded my horizon in a way for, for which I will be forever grateful. Um, it's changed my life. It's uh, having an impact on my own children's lives and will probably affect future generations of the John Rowe family um, because there's no going back once you recognize that there are systemic issues in this country that need to be addressed. Um, so I've, I've committed myself to having courageous conversations in my own life and using my, um, my platform, um, talking to folks within my spheres of influence, um, looking for every opportunity I can possibly find to enlist other people in, to join us in this anti-racism journey. Um, and not only that, but going from being not just an ally, but in social justice circles, you talk about moving along the spectrum of race, anti-racism um, to the point of becoming what's called a co-conspirator. You know, that's the language that they use in social justice. And that means that you are walking arm in arm. You are willing to put yourself in front of people to protect them. You are willing to risk your own comfort and safety in order to make sure people in vulnerable populations are not having to take that risk all the time, which they have historically had to do. Um, I'm also committed to the message of Martin Luther King and his, and what he's shown with peaceful protest, um, that that is the most effective method we know of to address and create positive change within communities and systems um, and nations. Um, so I, everything I've seen in Georgetown has been incredible. And I've gone to every uh, peaceful protest I've, I've known about and been able to attend downtown. It's in the heart of my district. These are my friends and neighbors and allies and co-conspirators. And uh, everything I've seen has been incredible and life affirming and um, has, has really, I think, seen these coalitions building and people coming together from all walks of life has been an experience that I will always remember. Um, when it comes to the community initiative, I, honestly, I'm waiting, I'm giving, I'm giving Chief Nero time and I'm waiting to see what the results are. Um, but I would personally like to see it have oversight authority. I'd like them to address the issue of school resource officers. Um, and those are just a couple of things that I, I in particular will be watching for. So I am cautiously optimistic and watching, but I, I really, it's all going to be about the result for me. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Walton and Ms. John Rowe for those uh, candid responses. Um, maybe if we can get another uh, community forum, maybe we'll get Chief Nero to come and talk to us about community.
So let's move on to economic development and living wage. Could you just give us your thoughts on this uh, about the city of Georgetown, you know, leading the way to providing at least a living wage compensation for all of its employees and insisting um, on the same for companies wanting economic development incentives uh, to relocate to the city of Georgetown, as well as vendors and their contractors. Uh, how do you think um, we can uh, address this issue? Ms. General, we'll start with you. Your three minutes begins now. I do feel the city has an obligation to invest our tax dollars wisely. And for me, wisely means paying a living wage. Um, because when folks that work for the city, when our contractors and vendors are making living wages, um, then they're going to be they're going to be able to turn around and contribute even more and put more money back into the community. So I think it reaps dividends on the back end when we make that investment up front. Um, I was actually, I know a lot of the folks that were involved in the, there was a spinoff from Courageous Conversations, a group of folks um, that did the research and actually looked at the data for uh, local government agencies and what they were paying and what their deficit was for the number of employees that did not receive a living wage. And fortunately, the city was at the bottom of the list. GISD and the county were a lot higher than the city in terms of um, number of employees that didn't make what was considered a living wage, which was based on the MIT model, if anyone's looking into that. Um, so the city is actually well positioned that we could quite easily make that investment in our employees and our contractors um, without um, it being a huge financial cost. And this is something I've been trying to get support for. Um, there's the, pro the issue is with um, our part-time workers and some of our contract workers. We need to put more effort into analyzing that and council should be asking some hard questions. Um, we also should insist if, some, if a company is going to get economic development dollars, then they need to demonstrate that they're going to pay a living wage for all of their employees. A lot of the data that we get for these um, proposals, economic development proposals for some of the larger companies, um, is that we see the average salary. Um, and I've actually uh, I've asked them to change the, and they've implemented this to change, to give us the range of what people get paid at those businesses. So we can see both the, the top CEO, what they're making, all the way down to the, the janitors and the support staff. Um, and we need, to, we need to say, if you want economic development dollars, then you're going to have to meet this metric of paying the living wage. Um, I also think we need to make a commitment as a city to, um, investing a, a, a set percentage of our economic development dollars back into locally owned businesses. Um, and we need to also do that with our locally owned minority businesses in particular. Um, a lot of folks know that we've lost a lot of our historic black owned businesses. For example, Perry's Garage. Um, so we need to we need to look to see what we can do to um, build back that um, vibrant community that did used to exist, but unfortunately doesn't any longer. Thank you, Ms. John Rowe. Mr. Walton, your three minutes begin now. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, I don't know the details of what every city employee or contractor or part-time worker gets paid. So I, I can't say that Georgetown is not, as a city entity, is not paying a living wage. I will say that we do need to ensure that all the departments are funded appropriately and that they are paying competitive wages for our area across the board. Also, I'm not sure that it's a long-term, the best idea long-term that the city impose wage requirements on, visitor, on businesses that are coming in or vendors or contractors that we work with. We certainly should make suggestions and recommendations and we could use the information when we're selecting uh, vendors or contractors or uh, deciding on which businesses may or may not get incentives or any other um, help. But ultimately, I think it's up to the employer, the employees themselves, and the market to decide what the wages are. Lastly, I think what's most important is when it comes to new businesses, we need to attract those businesses that are, by their nature, paying good wages. Uh, the term high tech comes up a lot, manufacturing. Uh, I think we all know what those types of businesses are, but we need to encourage them and attract them to Georgetown and uh, you know, not worry about whether or not they're paying them because uh, the nature of their business is that they are good paying jobs. 
And finally, related to one of the other questions, we also need to make sure that there are housing options available for their employees. So when those businesses come here and they're paying the living wage, then we want those people to live here and uh, spend their, their money and their tax dollars within Georgetown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Well, since we have a little bit of extra time, I'm going to try to combine uh, some of the questions that I'm seeing on Slido for you to address. And, and I'm kind of thinking that one of the themes is community involvement. You know, with the TRG neighborhood and all of the, the things that are going on uh, with, uh, with the neighborhood, um, there's a lot of questions or concern about how will you get the neighborhood, uh, the community involved, sorry. So um, what is your idea of what does engagement or involvement mean to you? And how will you specifically get the neighborhood and the community involved in whatever plans that you have uh, with the TNR, TRG? Uh, Ms. John Rowe, we'll start with you. If there's one thing I've learned over the last nine years is that engagement, in, uh, true engagement means going to where people are and not just sitting back and waiting for them to come to you. Um, so I have uh, long looked to expand my accessibility by being available through every platform and means I can think of and anyone that suggested, suggest, makes other suggestions I'm always open to that and trying something. So having, you know, regular coffee talk meetings at the library, um, being available on so various social media platforms, um, giving my, uh, making sure people have my email, giving my personal phone number to as many constituents as I possibly can, um, walking neighborhoods when there's something coming up that I think they'd be interested in delivering flyers, um, hosting neighborhood night out events, um, for the last 10 years um, and doing it in different locations. So I reach different parts of, uh, of our district. Um, everything I can think of. Um, and I also am always looking for opportunities to, to get our staff to recognize that they need to, to do the, be the ones to make the effort to reach out and get into the communities. Um, so like, for example, with the small area plan, I recently someone suggested this to me. So I passed it on to staff and said, hey, can we work with Parks and Rec? to like set up the blow up movie screen in one of the local parks and have a socially distanced movie night that's then followed by or preceded or followed by information about the small area plans and getting questions from people. So I'm an innovative thinker by nature. Um, I'm an inclusive thinker by nature. So I'm always looking for opportunities along those lines and, and really um, getting out there and meeting folks where they're at. Never mind the fact that, you know, I just meet, meet new people and talk to them every day, just being out and about in the community. Um, so it's, it's an, an ever, it's an ongoing and forever process for me. Thank you, Ms. John Rowe. Mr. Walton? Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for asking this question. I, um, <coughs> sorry. For me, I mean, the way that I have learned most about Georgetown and got involved is being out there, uh, going to the square for, for events, shopping on the square, walking around. I walk five days a week and I almost every single time somebody stops to talk to me and they don't know me. It's not because they know I'm a candidate or whatever. It's just we talk. Nice tomatoes, nice flower bed. I like your car or whatever it might be or just a friendly hello. Uh, I think being available, being out there, uh, being visible is very important. Um, also, uh, Chuck Collins shared a document with me, which was uh, the history of the, of the San Jose neighborhood. And when I read through it, uh, and I don't remember the exact name of it or when it happens, but there's an, a festival of sort that happens in the San Jose neighborhood. I think there's opportunity there, both in San Jose and TRG, to have community specific celebrations that are at least promoted or sponsored or supported by the city. Uh, we have Red Poppy, we have a Christmas thing, we have fundraisers, and they're all on the square. So why not have something that's more locally focused that is, uh, 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 recognizes a, the, a historical aspect of the neighborhood or something that they're doing as a community in, anyway, 
and invite the public to come and learn more about those communities and get involved. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be multiple days. It can be as one Saturday on a particular important month or, or day, uh, but we need to think about including things like that. Uh, so being available, participating, and then I would like to see uh, entertain the idea of having uh, neighborhood specific celebrations. Perfect. Thank you both for that. There, there seems to be a lot of questions about the neighborhood plan. And so I'd like for you to address, um, one of the questions is, will the neighborhood residents be included in the development of a neighborhood, of the neighborhood plan? And if so, what role in developing, and what role will they have in developing and executing a neighborhood plan? Um, Mr. Walton, uh, we'll start with you. So my opinion on this uh, is that absolutely they should be. Uh, and frankly, I have a concern with the city council of, uh, spending $200,000 to bring an outsider in to do this. We may need an outsider, we may need a facilitator, but some of that money could be better spent in engaging with the citizens. Um, having events uh, and listening, documenting, and processing what they hear and then representing it as a plan, maybe show options. But as I said earlier, it's also extremely important that the residents know the impact of whatever's being proposed. And we need to figure out some way to, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, to have a vote, I think. so. Some people may not be able to participate. Some may, people may not necessarily want to participate or they are discouraged from doing so because they feel like they haven't been heard. But if something were made available to them uh, anonymously, privately to review and possibly vote on, uh, I think that would be also very beneficial. Uh, ultimately, I think the biggest issue here is recognition of the area and the history of it. And we could do that immediately with very little expense. Uh, what I heard, what I have heard is, nobody knows about us, nobody cares that we're here. And I think if we can change that ASAP, then we're making great progress. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Walton. Ms. John Rowe? Yes, thank you. Um, I think that community involvement is instrumental in the small area plans. From what I've seen when they've done similar um, plans in other cities, it really is supposed to be a ground up um, swelling of support for an idea that is um, generated by the citizens themselves. And any consultant we bring in needs to be absolutely clear and on board with that, that they're only there as facilitators to help make sure, to help expand outreach efforts, to gather the feedback and then put it into a document that is then um, distributed and accessible to all. Um, so we want to make sure that the, the, any contractor we bring in is absolutely clear on what the goals are and then um, and sticks to that. Um, for anyone that went through the update to the downtown master plan, um, just for comparison, we spent, uh, the city spent a quarter million dollars just on the update to the downtown master plan. Um, so it's not unusual for us to make significant investments in these kind of guiding documents, and they're important because staff uses those to then make recommendations to council, um, and they follow those documents. Um, it's a little wonky, but it's true. You know, these, these, these documents are incredibly important, but yes, it needs to come from the ground up from the citizens that live in those areas. Areas. Um, I like to, there was a, a podcast recently with a UT professor that's been doing work in Texas about um, expanding our definition of history and recognizing that the history isn't just found in, you know, the, these fancy buildings, but it's found in, in sometimes in empty spaces too, um, or in places that don't get the same sort of recognition as some of our other historic neighborhoods. Um, and I think that uh, I'm seeing growing awareness at the staff level, um, and at the elected official level, that this is the kind of lens we need to use when looking at areas like the TRG in San Jose. Um, and there's also things we can do. I, I wish that the council had approved some sort of moratorium while we were doing while we're doing the small area plan, because I think that 
um, we're already seeing changes there and development that's having an, an impact and that's making people more and more concerned about the future, their future ability uh, to afford to live in their own neighborhood. Um, but they did not do that. Um, however, there are things we can do to pursue landmark status for buildings within this area while we're waiting for the small area plan um, and, and also addressing the other concerns that we've learned about regarding, you know, uh, traffic and the speed of traffic and parking. Um, so it's, it's a multi-pronged process, that's for sure, to get to, to address, because you guys are not a homogenous community. There's a lot of different needs that need to be met. Thank you both uh, for your responses and that there's, again, there's, you know, there, there seems to be a lot of questions and, uh, and concern about inclusion and being included in the process. And I just personally hope, because I kind of do this as a living, is even as you guys begin, and I don't even know what stage you are at, at working with a contractor, but before you even start the contractor process, that you make sure that you're getting the community involved in what is it that you're getting the contractor to do. It's almost you're bringing them in at the end of the of the game after you've already told the contractor what to do. So hopefully there will be engagement with the community before you even start the contracting process for someone to, to help. That's just my two cents. So with that, we're, we're almost uh, at our time. And if we had get a few more, uh, get another question in later, uh, we will. But I do want to uh, ask you to give me some closing remarks um, as we wrap up. Uh, specifically, uh, I want you to tell us what makes you the right candidate for citizens to vote for you uh, as our District 6 candidate. What is your vision for the future of Georgetown for TRG? How will you ensure that you are including or considering the needs of all of the community? And how will you work, most importantly, how will you work with other council members to garner support for your positions. Um, we're going to give you five minutes on this one, okay, as you write, make your closing remarks. So, uh, Ms. Jamra, we'll begin with you. All right, thank you. Well, thank you again, Chuck, Regina, everyone with the SEGCC and GCCMA. I really appreciate this opportunity. Oh, okay, so your first question. Um, I've been giving this one some thought, and um, I think the thing that makes me a good uh, public servant is the fact that I am by nature an introvert um, with a desire for justice and um, I think a pretty strongly developed sense of humility, which feels like an oxymoron to be bragging about being humble. Um, but that's what I came up, you know, that's what I've come up with when I thought about this because I'm not a person that seeks out the limelight. I'm much, I much prefer, you know, the conversations that happen um, with my constituents when we're all just sitting around a table or, you know, hanging out at the park or out walking our dogs. Um, th that's, that's really where I feel most comfortable and like I'm, I'm doing the most for my communities when I'm, I'm actually engaging with folks and getting their feedback and stuff. I'm not, I'm not one that's eager to, you know, get my picture in the paper. Um, but you guys asked the question. So that's what I came up with. Um, I've been uh, talking about including Inclusive growth in Georgetown for a while. That's been, you know, one of my um, primary plat, uh, planks in my platform for some time now. Um, it's it's uh, inclusive to me means that we acknowledge the contributions of all our different communities within Georgetown, and also recognize that the impacts of growth are felt disparately among our communities. So for example, you know, the business community can be really excited about all the growth that's happening. The, the building community might be really excited about it, but the, the impact is, is not necessarily all positive. In fact, just sometimes it's more negative than positive um, for some of our communities, particularly our minority communities and our historic uh, families that have lived here for multi-generations. Um, my, my toolbox over the years has really grown in terms of uh, personally and in the community. Um, like I said, my work with Courageous Conversations has equipped me with the um, vocabulary to talk about a lot of these, these um, topics that a lot of people find difficult to talk about. Um, I also know a lot more of the organizations and the community leaders and just, you know, the everyday residents within my district. Um, so I have those connections. Um, <clears throat> 
And as, we, as I had mentioned earlier, I've really worked hard on being accessible to folks. I mean, some of, a lot of you have gotten my card from me that I actually um, personally pay to, to print up because it has my social media and my personal phone number on there. And I hand it out like Halloween candy in my district. Um, so for any of you that don't have it, if you want it, send me an email through my website and I will get you my phone number if you're more comfortable talking to me on the phone um, rather than communicating by email or on uh, social media posts. Um, so all of that, I think I've lost track of the questions within the question. I think I'm approaching, um, so yeah, just so as I guess we're wrapping up. So for those of you, go to, go to my website if you want more information about my campaign or want to reach out to me, like I said, ask for my phone number if you want it, you'll get it. Um, find me on social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram, Rachel for Georgetown. Um, I'm here. I'm ready. I'm, I'm an active listener. I've worked on those skills real hard. I can, I can take constructive feedback. Um, I don't get defensive. Um, that's another thing I've learned through courageous conversations. Um, so here I am. So thank you guys. Thank you, uh, Ms. John Rowe. Uh, Mr. Walton, you're, to, you're up. Okay, thank you. Thanks again to GCCMA and SEGCC for sponsoring this forum. As I said at the beginning, I think they're very useful and important for the citizens uh, to help them make their decisions on who to vote for. Uh, as far as why I'm a good candidate for District 6 City Council, uh, you know, I've already mentioned this, but I'm out there. I'm engaged. I'm ready to meet, talk, uh, be involved, participate in everything, which I have already been doing as a, as a citizen, but would like the opportunity to do more so as a member of council. Uh, I think that it is very important to have somebody who will listen, who will engage, uh, and will take action based on that. The action might be uh, the best result, or the action might be the honest result, which is we can or cannot do this, but we can do it in a different way. As far as engaging with the rest of council, I think it starts with respect. Uh, you have to be able to work with someone independent of their opinions and their beliefs on a particular topic. Find the common ground first and then build from there. It's not a black or white, all or nothing um, option. Uh, we need to find the gray areas uh, and work towards a common goal. Um, Lastly, and very simply stated, I think after nine years, it's time for a new perspective. It's time for a change. Uh, and I think uh, it would be great to have the opportunity to try to do some of the things I've mentioned here and see what can be done for TRG and all of Georgetown. Thank you. Well, on behalf of GCCMA, SEGCC and the entire community, I would like to thank you, Ms. Rachel John Rowe, and you, Mr. Michael Walton, for taking this time to have a discussion and to answer these questions from the community. Uh, we thank you, community. Oh, there's his, his okay. Rachel, you put yours back up too. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, um, I'd like to thank you, community, for your participation. We thank you for asking the questions in Slido and just uh, remaining diligent. We want to remind you, October 13th, get yourselves out and vote. Get your friends out and vote. Election day is November 3rd, 2020. For information about where you can vote, you can go to uh, Williamson County Voting Information, www.wilco.org forward slash Wilco votes. You can also go to the GCCMA web website, uh, www.gccmatx.org and go to the community tab. And then you can go to the SEGCC website for election information. We will be hosting the Mayor's Candidate Forum at 11 o'clock. So if you're not registered, please make sure you do so or call a friend and tell them to participate. Now, really quickly before we go or ask another question, I would like to debut uh, our little video that uh, GCCMA and SEGCC uh, collaborated on.
Hello, Georgetown community. The Georgetown Cultural Citizens Memorial Association, in association with the Southeast Georgetown Community Council, brings you greetings and voter information today. November 2020 is a historic time. As we deal with a global pandemic, we are electing our next president, a new mayor, city council members, school board trustees, and countless other races. In Georgetown and throughout the country, they are expecting record turnouts. So we wanna take some time out to encourage you to vote. Here are three simple tips that we believe that can help you. First, know when you can vote. Early voting begins Tuesday, October 13th through Friday, October 30th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. And on Sundays, October 18th through the 25th from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. Second, know where you can vote. For specific voting locations, visit www.wilco.org slash departments slash elections slash voting. We encourage you to vote early to avoid election day crowds. And third, there are no straight ticket voting this year. So completing your ballot may take a little time. You can print out a sample ballot by going to the Williamson County website, click on voter lookup, and sample ballot. You can mark your selections and bring them to the poll. So now you're ready to plan your vote. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to share this information and encourage your family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors to vote. So again, thank you again, and we will see you back at 11 o'clock.